Right, this is Ask Me Anything round two. So I've got some questions asked after the last one. Um, I'm going to be throwing some medium travel mugs uh, and I will answer as I go. So, as per last time, any questions from anything I say or just general questions, put them in the comments and I will answer them in the next video. First question is a very good one. Um, it's a big question, which is how do you price and sell your work? So, I mean, that encompasses an awful lot of variables. Um, pricing, I have a spreadsheet that I used when I started. I'll link and I'll link to the blog post where I explain how it works. But basically, what it does is it looks at the amount you want to earn a month and then divides that by how many pieces you could make a month based on your kiln capacity and your time. So, um, there are two different ways of looking at how much work you can make in a month. And the reason I did it that way is because there's a very big difference between something big and easy to make, like a, a straightforward fruit bowl with nothing done to it, or say, a planter or a vase that could fill your entire kiln. Uh, even if you could throw 10 of them a day, it doesn't matter because you can't buy a ten of them a day. And then on the flip side, you might have something like a teapot where there's a lot more hours worth of work into it than like the, the bowl or the planter or whatever. So you put a lot more time in it, but it takes up less space in the kiln. And so it will depend on the speed at which you work, the complexity of your work, the size of your kiln and the frequency that you can fire it, which one is more limiting for which kinds of pieces. And I haven't actually revisited it recently. Um, I, for me it was always, I could fire more mugs than I could make and I could make more bowls than I could fire. So what you really want is a mixture of the two in the kiln. Well, assuming you're just going for optimising both of them. So you don't want to be limited by either. Um, and then, depending on how much money you need for where you're living, that answer will be different. If you're trying to make pottery your, your sole income in a city, uh, that calculation is going to be quite different to someone who owns their own kind of house or whatever out somewhere that's very cheap to live. So check that out for a rough starting point as to how much you need to charge. And that's how much you need to charge, not so, not how much you should be charging, but it sort of sets the minimum amount. As in, you need a, a certain amount to cover outgoings. Um, this calculator makes some assumptions which aren't going to be true, such as um, every piece being sellable and no wasted space in the kiln and everything tessellated perfectly and so on and so forth. Meaning that you probably need to charge um, significantly more, although I did build it with two kind of, it works it out based on two numbers, so you tell it what your minimum is and what your goal is. So obviously if you're charging your minimum number then you've got to contend with the, the fact that any wastage and loss and additional costs mean that you're now not earning your minimum. But um, yeah, it's a starting point. Uh, and then how do you sell your work? Well, that is a much bigger question. And to be honest, 
I mean that really warrants its own video. Um, but the short answer is that it depends. It has changed obviously with COVID. Um, but I was always going to sell online anyway. Because I don't really like selling in person. And if you're wondering what this is, it's a little... Um, it's actually the stirring stick that I got with some resin uh, and I've cut two notches in it if you can see that and those notches when they line up with the clay the travel mug lids will fit perfectly for annoyingly for this clay and the KGM which I am stopping using which is actually a question coming up about that so I'll wait until then to explain but um, yeah based on individual shrink rates uh, next question do I ship to Australia yes I use FedEx at the moment for all my international pretty much all my other than tools pretty much all my international stuff gets sent through FedEx um, they are currently only operating the priority shipping to Australia so rather than try and keep on top of what they're charging to which countries, um, I just make a little bit less money and you get your stuff sooner if you're in Australia at the moment. But I'm pretty sure once um, COVID settles down a bit, uh, that'll go back to, they'll, they'll offer more options again. Um, how did I get started and how did I decide to be a potter? Uh, this was asked in the comments of the last one and someone pointed that person to a previous video which I will link to below. Uh, essentially I got into it accidentally making coasters because we wanted some coasters and then snowballed from there. Um, did I find a replacement for the KGM? As I was saying, I'm having issues with it. Ongoing issues that don't look like they're going to be resolved anytime soon. Um, I have found two replacements that I think are equally promising at the moment. Uh, one is the PF580 from Scarva, and the other is the Pottery Craft Earthenware Throwing Play. Interestingly enough, Pottery Craft also do a superior earthenware clay, which is inferior in just about every way to the cheaper throwing clay. So, would not recommend the superior clay but the non-superior clay is just fine and is quite cheap and throws nicely it's whiter um, the only thing is it's very soft in the bag which is the only reason I haven't fully committed to that one because uh, it's harder to throw bigger pieces and I don't know I just need to get used to it maybe but I've ordered more of both of them and I will be throwing more with them over the coming weeks and months um, particularly over the coming weeks because I have a Valentine special glaze which I will hopefully see if I, I've got a picture of one I'll let it, it in it's going to be a pink sprinkles sort of glaze um, and I think that will look much better on a light clay so I want to get that sorted in time to make stuff and have them ready for Valentine's so yeah I'll be using more of that coming right, yeah, more of that over the next few weeks that's good these require a bit more thought than the swirly things I was throwing last time and it's hard I mean it's hard enough talking coherently and throwing, but um, these are harder than the, la the pieces in the last video were. So apologies if I keep stopping talking when I'm doing something more precise. Um, I don't really know I'm doing it until I, until I catch myself afterwards, but there are points where I can't do both. Um, Ah, this is a good question. Okay, well, I say it's a good question. 
it's a question that I don't think many people could answer, but I can because I've done it. Um, is it worthwhile to drin, p drill pinholes in um, the wheel head yourself? Um, the reason being that they were looking at a wheel that didn't come with the pins, and the pins are very useful for pinning bats in. Uh, my old wheel didn't come with um, pins, and the wheel head wasn't removable. And I was kind of setting up my studio cheaply when I got the wheel, so I, I didn't look into having someone come out to drill the pins. You can send, if you can get your wheel head off, you can often send them off to um, kind of manufacturers, and there will be people who are equipped to drill holes, and they will drill holes for you if you want them to. Um, I didn't look into that because I couldn't get it off to send, so they'd have had to have come to me or I've had to ship a rather hefty wheel um, and I didn't have the money for that and to be honest I thought how hard can it be? Now, it's not hard to drill effective um, holes and they will work, but they will work to a degree. And the reason is that even if the distance between them is exactly what you wanted it to be, if they are off center, as in off, they don't, if you drew a line between them, it doesn't pass exactly through the center of the axle. It's not a problem when the bats are on the right way round. Um, and it's not a problem if you don't put work back on the wheel like, well, you've seen in previous videos of mine. What I'll do with these is I'm setting them aside on the bat and I'll bring them back tomorrow to do the first trim while they're still stuck to the bat and wire them off afterwards. Now, if your bat pins aren't perfectly aligned with the center of the axle, you have to make sure you put them back the right way round. Because even though the holes are the right distance apart so the bat will fit on either way round, if they're off centre, even slightly, the any movement is exacerbated. So if you're half a millimetre off, just one pin's migrated round slightly, like if you imagine a slid Nice and stuck with slip. Yeah, if I slid the bat round just a fraction that way, the pins are still the same distance apart, but they're now not centered. And if I could get it to stay put and turn the wheel on, I mean, it's not a very good test because it's also at an angle, but you see that that offset would make the work wobble. Well, obviously, if you threw it one offset one way and then you turn it round, it's now offset the other way. So half a mil becomes one mil worth of movement, which basically makes them untrainable that way. So you wouldn't be able to put the work back on and do anywhere near a good enough job of trimming it um, if you got it backwards. Now, obviously, you can put it on, see if that's the right way around, if it's not, take it off, put it the other way around, which is what I did for years. Um, whether or not that's worth it to you to do it yourself, have a less neat job and have a bit more faff while you use it versus paying someone to do it is entirely up to you. Um, but if you've got a newer wheel, chances are the wheel head is removable and you can buy a new wheel head. So if anyone's considering drilling their own bat pins, just be very careful about the positioning and understand that any off-centeredness is, is fine while you're throwing, um, but is a problem if you return any work to the wheel. And um, so it can be done, it's fine, it's not ideal, it's not perfect. Um, so I would only recommend it if uh, you've got, if it makes sense to you, having heard all that. And some people, that will work for. But yeah, it definitely isn't the end of the world. 
Um, what is my favourite clay to use and what is my favourite glaze? Well, it would have been KGM until recently, which means it's now this clay, which is anthracite, which is in a lot of ways very similar to KGM, uh, except it's not currently causing me issues and I like, I prefer the colour of it. So to work with, it's basically the same, but pretty much, I think all bar one of the mugs of mine that I've kept and have at home are in the anthracite because I prefer how most glazes look over it. Um, and what's my favourite glaze? At the moment, it's Midnight Surf, which is named Midnight Surf after Ryan from Midnight Ceramics, who make uh, kind of short run, interesting glazes. So check them out. I'll post a link if you haven't seen their stuff. They make, yeah, it's just an interesting glaze company who would, because I know Ryan knows his glaze chemistry well and is setting out to make them reliable and well formulated glazes um, you kind of know what you're getting with that and they are going to be good glazes and they're interesting he's doing interesting stuff with chemistry um, and it's a cool idea to have a, a small batch glaze like an artisan glaze company plus he's doing it well so definitely check them out um, but he sent me the frit uh, three one three two six nine three two six nine. I posted about in the previous video what makes it so interesting and what makes it interesting is it doesn't have any alkaline earth in it pretty much so you can then make interesting glazes and the first thing I tried was reformulating a floating blue without any calcium pretty much other than the residual without any calcium in just using strontium and that's Midnight Surf Recipes on Glazy, I'll post a link below and I'll post a picture now. Um, but not only is it the most interesting single glaze I've ever used, uh, it is also, thus far, incredibly reliable. It goes on really well. You don't need it to be super thick to get a nice colour because a lot of glazes that have a lot of movement and patterning in when thick aren't so nice when thin and that was the thing I always hated with regular floating blue was that um, if you put it on too thin you get a really meh colour um, one of my changes to regular floating blue to improve it was swapping out the iron for manganese which made the colour wear thinner more sort of purpley blue <clears throat> rather than greeny yellow so it's a vast improvement I'll, i've got a blog post about this because it's all done as part of the samara materials workshop advancing glazes class i was experimenting with floating blues and that was um I, I came up with some other tweaks that you could make with the simplest one is just swap the iron for manganese uh, manganese dark side and you can do a one for one swap doesn't drastically alter the chemistry at all, um, doesn't drastically alter the colour, but the change it does make is nice. Um, but yeah, even with that, floating blues, regular floating blues, tend to be a bit rubbish over light clays when they're thin. They just, they look exactly like that. They look like a, a glaze that's been applied too thin. So, my work generally needs the glazes to be relatively thick to get the patterns that I'm after. Um, Midnight Surf generates its own patterns because it, um, it's phase separating and it's doing a whole bunch of interesting stuff, which actually means you don't, it doesn't really need to be combined with anything else. It doesn't add anything to it, it just makes it messier, noisier. Um, on its own it's perfectly good interesting glaze and when it's thin it's still a really deep nice kind of midnight sky blue um, which makes it 
well, yeah, my favourite place to work with and one of my favourite places to look at. I've got a couple of pieces that I've kept in it. Um, and I think it's easily the single most, the glaze that's the most interesting on its own and probably up there with some of the combinations that I layer one or uh, several glazes to to get them to do more dramatic things. It can kind of rival that on its own. So, a good glaze to purchase from me and a good glaze to make yourself from the recipe on Glazy if you can get over the frit. Had an email from Pottery Crafts this morning. Again, they found a different supplier, um, so they might actually be able to start stocking it soon, which is great news for us in the UK. If you're in America, it's much easier to come by. So you can just buy it from, because it's from Ferro Frit, um, who are an American company. And so we only get what gets imported by the ceramic suppliers, unless you want to buy it and import it yourself which I don't, but I believe Ryan has shipped me another bag of it, um, which will tide me over until Pottery Craft sorts it out, which is very kind of him. Um, next question, I don't even really understand. Can I draw slash paint on ceramics before firing them? Now, I don't know how much the question asks uh, knows about ceramics because you can draw and paint with underglaze you can get underglaze pencils you can get underglaze brushes you can get underglaze stamping pads and those will all go on before glazing or before bisking and they are something in a medium so you can get blue ones that presumably are cobalt and you can get you know various other colors of things or their stain, I don't really know. But the point is that someone has formulated a pencil out of underglaze that works well enough as a pencil. Um, and obviously, because it's underglaze, it's, it behaves like underglaze. So they're just different ways of applying it. The painting on is even easier because obviously you can paint anything you want using glaze or underglaze on ceramics before firing it. And that's generally what we do so if you ever ask that men um, can they use those methods to apply a design to something yes if they meant can they draw in pen or paint with acrylic on before firing them no um, you can draw in Sharpie as anyone who's seen some of my other kind of technique videos well, no, you can draw in Sharpie on leather hard pieces. I use it as a guide for things like impulse dots. Um, and it will burn off completely in the firing, in the bisque firing, that is. So it's a good way to add lines when you're making that you don't want to remain there when it's fired. And obviously, for that reason, no good for making marks that you do want to be there when it's fired. If you're wondering what I'm throwing now, these are just the scraps of clay that were left and I throw them into little tumblers, they're good as glaze tests. And I generally send out a free gift with every order because that's always the more fun part of opening something and you get something unexpected. Uh, you know what you're getting with the thing that you've ordered, but having a nice little extra, people use them as shot glasses or espresso glasses. The reason that I throw them like this is because that will fit inside a mug. Um, so it's worth having, if you're going to do it, um, kind of gift things in smaller versions of the things that you sell. So that's part of where the trinket goes, if you can see them in the background. They're, they fit within all the other bowls, so they're a good thing to include if someone orders a fruit bowl, you can give them a matching um, trinket bowl. If someone orders a mug, you can give them a matching or not matching, depends how organized I've been. But you can give them a little tumbler and it goes inside, doesn't take up any extra room, and it's a nice gift. And a lot of people who have uses for things like that um, will find them just as good as the mug. I mean, I'm sure some people get it and wonder what they're going to do with it. If you don't have an espresso machine and you don't 
drink small amounts of anything, then maybe it's, you might use it for kind of sauces when you're having a, a meal that you want to kind of put something out on the table. I don't know. I'm sure some people don't really know what to do with them. But that's what they are, that's why I'm throwing them. Um, the nice thing is, <coughs> sorry, they you don't need to weigh out the clay particularly, this is about 150 grams, but just a small ball of clay and having a variety of sizes is good, so you really don't need to be too precious about these. Um, what is the tool you could not work without in your studio? I mean, the, I use the wheel more than anything, obviously. Um, but if we're talking just tools, the ones that I use the most would definitely be the ribs. Oh no, sponge. It's got to be the sponge. So, I use a Zeem porcelain sponge. Um, they're a little less commonly seen. Most people, if they're using anything, will use a mud tools one or will use these sorts of ones that you get for, well, in the kits, the, the starter kits. Um, there's a, there is a big difference. Uh, I'm not going to say that it will make a big difference to everyone, but I find, because these are much denser, so they're more like a halfway between a sponge and a rib. So it means you can throw differently with them. Those, the one I was just waving about, and the mud tools ones are softer. Um, meaning that it's the pressure of your finger through the sponge more than it is the sponge as a rib. Um, if you're used to that, you might find these a little strange at first, but um, but I much prefer them. I've got both, and I only use these just because. I mean, firstly, it's what you're used to, and secondly, I think that solid ribness is a really nice addition to throwing it makes everything a bit smoother because it distributes the pressure more over and over kind of spreads out over an area so you don't get such pronounced throwing lines and you can apply more force without warping the clay so if you haven't tried one get one to try they're not that much more than any other sponge they're not stupidly cheap like the ones that you can get from Amazon, from Amazon in those packs of 10 for a pound. But um, if you're looking at good sponges, try a Zeem one. Of course, they do a stoneware one. I don't, I think I might have used it once and it wasn't drastically different. The porcelain one's a little bit finer grained um, and I like it. So yeah, that's the one tool that I definitely could not, well, I mean, obviously I could replace it with something else, but. Um, I wouldn't want to throw without a sponge, and I wouldn't want to throw without one of those sponges if I didn't have to. The other tools, the triangle turning tool, um, my foot trimming tool, is very useful. Though every piece has one of the two of them, depending on what the foot's going to be. Uh, and then I've got this rib. Someone asked me, and I meant to reply, but the way that YouTube comments work, I lost the comment, and then hard to find out where it went, just because... It only tells me of top level comments and makes them easy to find. So if you comment on a video, I can always find them. They're very easy to find. If you reply to one of my comments, I get a little notification that once it's gone, I then have to manually go through each video to see if I can find the comment that you replied to. So someone asked about this. Um, it's by a company called Colorobia. Um, I've only ever seen them from um, oh, what are they called? Ho Ceramic Hobbycraft, I think. Pottery Hobbycraft. Because there's a big company in the UK called Hobbycraft and this company are in no way affiliated with them. It's sort of like a paint your own pot style. They do earthenware and they do earthenware glazes. And so they're not, they don't have a great selection of tools, but when I started out with my coasters, I was doing earthenware and they were quite in a, because they didn't have a, a great selection, they had a clay that would work, they had a slab roller and they had glazes that would work. Whereas other places I had to try and figure out whether or not 
a specific product they sold would work. Anyway, um, meant that I bought most of the stuff that I started with from this company whose name is currently eluding me. Hobby Ceramicraft. Hobby Ceramicraft. And I'll post a link to it. I keep meaning to buy another one, actually, maybe while I'm linking to it, I will. Because I've never seen that exact one for sale anywhere else, and I've bought other companies' version of it, the small, soft ribs, and they're never quite the same. So, yeah, I'll buy another one of them. Um, but that one's really nice, plus my green mud tools one that I use a lot. Um, those are kind of the top things. Uh, Hartley and Noble Russian Doll Bat System. I'd definitely replace that if it if anything happened to it. Recommend that, recommend the Giffen Grip. There's um that I need to carry on doing that series of my top studio tools. I think I've addressed about half the ones that I've mentioned so far in that they've got their own video. Um and I will pick that up probably after Christmas, just because of time. But maybe I'll get some spare time before them. Um, <laughs> I would love some tips and stuff about getting started. I personally want to, but I'm broke. Well, unfortunately, other than knowing someone with pottery stuff, um, your best bet is to go into a studio, but even then it's not going to be cheap. Um, if you really are broke, then pottery pottery, as in fired in a kiln pottery rather than air dry pottery or air dry clay um, it's just expensive so there's no real way to to do it really cheap whichever way you do it it's a, a decent investment of time and money um, and if you want to do it consistently to be able to make usable pieces there is a financial investment that is hard to get around. Um, how long did it take you to make your studio? It's still ongoing. I mean, as in, I started, I forget now, what, four years ago, five years ago? However, four years ago. Yeah, four years ago. Um, and I bought some of the stuff. And then I bought this wheel earlier this year. So obviously, um, and I'll be buying a new kiln next year. So it's ongoing. But until I had a, a decent studio set up, it was probably a year, I reckon. Um, how long did it take to throw confidently? Probably a year. I'd say I could centre passably and consistently make pieces after a few months but the point at which I could confidently make a piece in the shape broadly speaking that I set out to so as in I say I'm going to make a tumbler of this size and it comes out the proportions and size that I intended uh, I reckon that was probably a year and I was because I was doing it kind of in my spare time while doing the coasters and the hand building but full-time pottery so I was doing ceramics full-time but not throwing full-time I still think I was able to get on the wheel probably five or six times a week not for a huge amount of time but like half an hour throw a few pieces um, but I got that immediate feedback which obviously you're not going to get if you're doing it in a studio that you can only get in once a week uh, when, why do you not sell a piece? Well, firstly there are glazed floors, so I don't sell anything that's um, where the glaze has crawled and the, the glaze has moved off the, the clay and so you can see through to the clay underneath. Um, you can do that intentionally, but if you haven't done it intentionally, it's a glazed floor and I, I'm not happy knowing that it's a floor and that I didn't want it, so I don't sell pieces with that. Um, if it's got pinholes, blisters, that sort of thing, that rules it out. Sometimes the glaze will have a fault, a very small fault like that on the outside. And depending on how good the rest is and how... If it's a piece where... 
I don't generally sell anything with any faults that I've noticed um, but there will be small things like that that I, I check the inside more carefully because that's the food surface um, and you can have small surface variation on the outside and I kind of sometimes I'll let that go ideally I'd never send out anything that I wasn't perfectly happy with the problem is that um, as I get better my standards get more exacting which means that I'm still in that position sometimes of having a piece that probably no one else would notice the thing that I've noticed um, and I still don't want to send it out um, also the same with glazes sometimes the glaze hasn't worked exactly the way that I want it to I know that a lot of times other people would be happy with that um, but I struggle to send out anything that I'm that I wouldn't stand fully behind um, so it's an evolving thing there are some things which are that immediately rule it out and the blisterings especially on the inside is one of them which is the issue that I was having with the KGM uh, just blistering like crazy um, if I look at a piece and think that I would be I wouldn't be happy if I saw someone using it so as in I'm looking at it thinking that's probably good enough that no one else would notice the flaws but if I saw someone you know post it to Instagram or whatever I wouldn't be happy rather than thinking I'm so I'm glad you've got that piece it's a really nice piece I'd be thinking oh, that piece isn't right I won't send it out um, especially now I charge a bit more when it started I charged less and I like to think that I charged the right sort of amount for the skill that went into the pieces but as I've got better and as my standards have got better my prices have also gone up so it's important to kind of maintain that you evolve your standards as your prices go up as well so there's no hard and fast rules a lot of people draw a line somewhere and some people might think that I draw the line kind of too low and send things out with that they wouldn't have sent out I don't know to be honest I don't know enough potters who have my work yeah I don't know it's an interesting one um, but I guess the real test is once you go beyond the does it have any flaws that um, would make it dangerous to use or unusable or anything like that if it's a usable piece where the flaws are aesthetic um, it just comes down to how you feel about it if you look at the piece and think it's a really nice piece I'd be happy to use it that's one thing if you look at the piece and think it's not a nice piece I wouldn't be happy to use it but I don't know if anyone else will notice up to you and then each situation's different if someone needs it for a deadline I've had personalized pieces where they're needed for a given day and they've had a flaw that might have meant that someone with a relaxed timeline would have it remade or at least check that they'd have it remade obviously again nothing that would make the piece not safe to use um, but certainly that does factor in if it's a choice between them having nothing or having a, a piece that's slightly less than perfect um, I guess I think most people would rather have something but if in doubt ask the customer send them a picture of it and say it'll take this long to remake and this is the problem and you'll get split some people say there's no rush if you think you can improve on it do it some people say that floor is fine I like it that way um, but yeah go with go with your gut go with your conscience and if in doubt at the very least check but um, always better to send out things that are perfect if you can so I tend to err on the side of remaking wherever possible um, Final one is what are some great online resources for new clay makers to learn further about technique skills? 
Good question. Um, I'm probably a bit out of date on this because when I was looking it was a few years ago. There's Ceramics Art Daily, there's um, the Potter's Cast. If you go through you'll learn so much from listening to them. Um, obviously people on YouTube I try and be useful. I don't know John does. So between us, um, I don't tend to watch that many YouTube channels for educational purposes now because, um, or at least not specifically, uh, you can always learn stuff from other people, but there's certain things like I'm not going to change how I throw because I've seen someone else throw differently because I'm, because once it becomes entrenched, it's, um, unless there's a good reason to change, it's just one of those things. So you just do it the way that you're used to. Um, I'll post any resources I think of in the comments. If anyone has got any suggestions, comment them and uh, I'll edit them in. Um, but there are some great resources and then obviously Glazy if you're making glazes, but if you are literally just starting out, you're probably not doing that immediately. Glazy's great. Uh, Ceramic Victoria's Workshop, who I mention a lot, are great. They're pricey. If you're not <coughs> at the point of making your own glazes, then there's no need to think about them, but when you are making your own glazes, um, you could do a lot worse than taking the Cone 6 class, which is the cheap one. The full Understanding Glazes Online course is $500, which is quite an investment. It's worth it, but you have to be at the point where $500 is a worthwhile amount of money to spend, however good the course is. Um, and yeah, I'll post anything else I think of. So if you've got any follow-up questions or any new questions, post them. I'll do another one of these next week with any questions from that one. Um, and that's it really. Anything else? Well, just comment anything below. Any Anything you think I could change about these? Anything you think I could improve? Or anything like that? Comment below. Um, and yeah, see you next week.